names of all the, the attendees. Yeah. Yes. Ms. Morrison, do you want to wait a few more minutes? Um, or because we have a quorum, do you want us to start? If you want to start with the review of the agenda, like the agenda piece. I could do that. And so maybe some um, additional attendees will arrive. Okay, I'll, you could, uh, we can go live in one minute. Let's do that way. Oh, we are live. We are live. Okay, we can go live right now then. <laughs> Good evening, uh, everyone. Good evening, uh, a Community Safety Working Group. It appears we have a quorum for this evening session, uh, which is beginning at 5.33 uh, p.m. Uh, meetings being called to order. And I'd like to begin by um, taking a roll call of attendance. Uh, you just acknowledge that you're here. Um, Ms. Ferreira? Here. Ms. Owen? Here. Mr. Vernon Jones? Here. Ms. Ms. Anoni Baku? Here. Ms. Walker? Here. Mr. Cage? Here. And myself. Thank you uh, all for attending. And as as always, I thank you for all the work that you're putting forth on behalf of the town of Amherst uh, to do this um, to complete this important task to really bring some uh, additional information to our community about safety, in particular in relation to the Amherst Police Department. I'm going to just quickly review uh, the agenda for the evening. We are. Um, we're going to go through our public comment as normal, as we usually do. Uh, we're going to open it up to open the floor up to our uh, working group members to see if they have any other pre-meeting announcements, announcements or some things they want to tell us about they, what they've been doing relative to this work bef since the last meeting. And, uh, and then from there, we're going to go right into our action and discussion items section, which is uh, tonight our first community-wide forum. Um, after that, we will um, we'll see if there are any upcoming events that need to be announced uh, within the group. And we will announce our next meeting date. And then any other tasks we need to uh, bring forward that haven't been brought to the chair's attention uh, in the last 48 hours. And then finally, we'll adjourn. So uh, given that, I would like to um, open up our um, meeting this evening to see if we have any public comments that need to be made. For those who are not familiar with this process, we are a, a listening group and uh, we usually devote up to 15 minutes for this particular piece. So we welcome your comments and, uh, and thoughts at this time. If you uh, can be recognized, uh, I don't know, Ms. Moyston, I guess, or Mr. Hannon will acknowledge you and- mm -hmm. you there, are, there are no hands up as of yet. Okay, we'll wait a couple of seconds. Okay, again, thank you everyone for, for being here. Um, just like to touch base quickly with our working group members. We've been uh, meeting a lot lately, uh, discussing a lot, working a lot, but it's always good to touch base to see if there are any things uh, uh, prior to our action discussion items that you'd like to share with, with the group. Uh, any updates relative to our work uh, things you want us to know about your experiences, and then we'll move forward.
Okay. Seeing none, I think we'll get to the heart of our business this evening, which is our community forum. Uh, Ms. Moyston, may I turn it over to you? Uh, you may. So I'm just going to do a little bit of share uh, screen sharing at the moment. So good evening and welcome to the first Community Safety Working Group Community Forum. For those who do not know me, my name is Jennifer Moyston. I am one of three community participation officers for the Town of Amherst, as well as the staff liaison for the Community Safety Working Group. Helping out today is IT Director Sean Hannon. And it is an honor to be here with you all. As always, I have a few logistics to go over. So this is a safe place and we will practice confidentiality, compassionate listening, respect, speaking from our own experiences and no judgment and no shaming. This is also a Zoom webinar. Only panelists and community members speaking will be seen. There is no community chat function. Please prevent background noise by keeping your microphone on mute, which you can find on the lower left side of your screen or star six on your phone. You may also raise your hand if you wish to share your experience. Click on participants at the bottom of your screen. Choose the raise hand icon or star nine on your phone. I will now introduce the Community Safety Working Group members. We have Mr. Paul Wiley, Chair, Brianna Owen, Vice Chair, Tashina Bowman, Darius Cage, Deborah Ferreira, Ms. Pat Anabaku, Russ Vernon Jones, and Alicia Walker. I'd like to start this event off with a statement of the indigenous heritage of the land. And so we humble, humbly acknowledge that we stand on Nanatuck land, acknowledging also our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nupmuk and the Wamp Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, and the Mohegan to the west and the Abenaki to the north. I would also like to acknowledge the contributions of African Americans written by Amherst resident Lauren Mills. Amherst recognizes the generations of African Americans that have contributed to the development of agriculture and historical academic preservation from the past to the present. We also recognize the rich spiritual culture, artistic contribution and pursuits of justice that have enriched the communities in which African Americans have lived, worked, persevered and achieved. So here are the list of questions and I'm now going to hand it over to Chair Paul Wiley. Thank you, Ms. Moyston. Um, uh, we as a, a working group um, have been working together since uh, the first week in December and collectively we put together a, a statement, an opening statement for our community forums, which I'd like to, to read at this time. Uh, we do wanna welcome our greater Amherst community to the first of two public forums by the Community Safety Working Group or as we like to call ourselves, CSWG. A second forum will be held on Saturday, January 16th from 3 to 5 p.m. These forums have been planned and organized by the CSWG to provide a vehicle for our group to listen to the comments, thoughts, and ideas relative to issues of safety and experiences uh, of community, community members with our Amherst Police Department. These forums are in keeping with the group's purpose and charge to execute the following. And I'm going to take a, a minute here just to talk about our purpose um, and our charge, both which are on the on the website where you can reference them as you as you see fit. But our purpose, uh, the purpose of the Community Safety Working Group is to make recommendations on alternative ways of providing public safety uh, services in, in the community and making recommendations on reform to the current organizational and oversight structures of the Amherst Police Department. Our charge is very straightforward. We're here to study the complex issues 
of delivering community safety services currently provided through the police department and other means to ensure racial equity. Specifically under this particular charge, we are here to recommend reforms to the current organizational and oversight structures, examine existing town funding priorities for delivering community safety services. And the working group can achieve this by doing the following, learning from previous work by the, the town through previous studies and, and committees, examining public safety services and how they are delivered, reviewing policies, complaints, and current training practices, exploring models of resident oversight of police departments, collecting data from people's experiences in Amherst, engaging the communities most impacted by policing to develop alternatives and identify solutions to diagnose problems. And finally, we are investigating alternative models such as Eugene uh, Cahoots crisis assistance, helping out in, on the street, Albuquerque, where they have community safety alternatives, Denver Star, the support team assisted response are just a few examples. The CSWG has been meeting weekly on Wednesday since the first week in December, with the exception of the last week in December 2020 to fulfill its duties and responsibilities to the town of Amherst. Our meetings are recorded and open to the public following open meeting law guidelines. You can find our agenda and links to the weekly Zoom, uh, weekly webinars on the town, Amherst, town of Amherst website at www.amherstmass.com, amherstma.gov, I'm sorry, .gov. Both forums that we're scheduled to have will be facilitated uh, by uh, Ms. Jennifer Moyston, the liaison to the town, uh, town of Amherst, the town manager's office. And the CWG will present questions which will serve as conversation prompts for those who wish to speak. It should be noted that we offer these questions to broaden the arena for responses and comments. They are not presented as a fixed list of specific questions to be answered separately. Our hope is that the open-ended approach will provide a useful and supportive space for sharing. Ms. Moyston will keep track of each person's speaking time to ensure that everyone has a fair opportunity to express their views. Uh, to the working group. And that being said, we have decided to hear from BIPOC or Black Indigenous People of Color voices first. Although we decided to hear from traditionally marginalized peoples first, please trust that we do want to hear and plan to take seriously input from everyone. While we will not be responding to comments from the community, our role will be to listen deeply and respectfully for what is being offered and to use the feedback to inform our work going forward. We have allotted two hours for each of these forums. These forums will be recorded and posted on our town website within the Community Safety Working Groups portal where they may, may be accessed by the community. Again, we want to welcome you to our first forum and we look forward to learning from you in the two hours we spend together. Thank you for coming and we're ready to get started. Okay, so I recognize that our hearts have been broken and healed and broken again. And now after the events of last Wednesday siege on the Capitol, our hearts are heavy. Referencing Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's Jr. book and address, I ask you all, where do we go from here, community or chaos? Many would say that there has been chaos for some time now. I also recognize that we are here in Amherst are sheltered in our tofu curtain of a town called Amherst, but it is the small communities of the nation that can help heal and mend our nation as a whole. 
we will, I ask that we all take a moment for some deep healing breathing so we can open our hearts and minds as I ring the singing bowl. Please take a few deep breaths with me. I don't know if you guys hope you can hear it. We now open the floor to hear your lived experiences. If you would like to speak, please raise your hand using the raise hand function. When you've been called upon, we will ask you to identify yourself and you will then be brought in as a panelist. If you wish not to show yourself and to stay anonymous, please turn your camera off. Each speaker will have about five minutes to speak. I now open the floor for comments. Sean. I can't quite see the panelists. Do we have any hands raised? No, no one has their hands raised right now. Okay. Vera Cage just raised their hand. Oh, yes. Come, Vera may come in. Hi, Vera. Do you have something, an like experience you would like to share? Okay. Can you all um, hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I uh, wanted to, um, my name is Vera Cage. I have lived in this community um, for about 15 years now, um, just about in the past 15 years. And before that, um, I came to UMass in, uh, in 1993 to attend UMass. I came to came back to Amherst because I thought this would be a wonderful place to raise my children. And um, just, you know, fast forward, um, right now I have a 14 year old in my home and also um, a 17 year old. And I, um, my experiences with, with with my understanding of the police um, so far is that, you know, just based upon um, uh, Chief Scott Livingstone's um, comments in the paper, you know, that he um, can barely recall when there was a gun discharged, right? A police officer discharging a gun. And so, so my comment would support, um, finding resources alternative um, to the police in terms of funding the police um, to be to better um, serve our, our young people. Um, in other communities, there's teen empowerment res um, resource type centers um, programming. And I find that that's lacking in this community. Um, we have leisure services or what was formerly leisure services. Um, and I believe that that's just not adequate for this community. Um, this community had um, a program outside of the school district called Youth Action Coalition. 
and the school district um, took over or um, there was an after school out of school time grant that the school district um, was able to secure. And so that left that um, small nonprofit um, youth organization um, hung to dry. And so there hasn't been anything to fill that void. And, um, but I want to recognize that there's the Boys and Girls Club, um, but uh, I know that they could probably be better served as well um, and could probably attest that there's not enough recreational spaces that are readily available um, for, for families without the means to take, you know, these extensive vacations and all that stuff. Um, I want to say that um, the experiences with the police are different for um, BIPOC communities. Um, I know advocates on the school system in, in the school district um, that had had to support families whose um, middle school age child was um, in juvenile detention because of you know, our school district's um, inability to serve that, that family um, you know, without having to rely on the, on the criminal justice system. Um, so families, you know, and I, I wanna break the ice and I, I just wanna acknowledge that you're, you're probably not gonna hear a lot from the most vulnerable communities that need to be heard um, because there, there's so many issues involved. Um, it takes a lot of courage to um, speak about the police and even more courage to speak against the police. And um, in my experience working with families in, in supporting them to be able to come out and support their young person who, is, who has had an inter a negative interaction with the police, there is um, fear of, of um, retaliation because perhaps a member of their family, a loved one is not documented. And so when we, uh, when we, you know, I think, I think the committee um, needs to be aware that while, you know, we have these, you're holding these public forums. Um, and in my experience too, with the school district, um, these public forums are probably not the best ways, best way to engage with community. Um, I know that in the school district, when we want to um, engage with families. Um, we've been wanting to get the school system to put in money to do um, participant act, participatory action research type of um, methods to bring and engage with community. Um, we also want to be able to um, compensate people for their time. Um, we want people to share and divulge and all of these things but there's a lot of costs, a lot of risks, a lot of um, consequences people are weighing when, when they're trying to, to make these de de decisions to open up and to engage. Um, the Department of Children and Family, you know, is, is another entity with the police um, that a lot of folks, you know, aren't too keen about. Um, so when you're talking, you're a public, you know, committee, and you want to hear from real voices, real residents. Um, you're probably going to have to think about other strategies um, that are perhaps, you know, longer term. Um, that are perhaps um, more about investing in 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 leadership development in young people. Um, I would love to see this community do like a summer jobs program where young people can be employed. Um, when they turn, you know, 14, they can get their working papers. You know, I want them to be able to, after COVID is over, you know, be able to work in town hall, be able to shadow, you know, different people in their different capacities um, because town hall needs to really be um, racially diverse in order for us to really have racial equity in this community. Um, that, that'll help a lot. Um, over my time, um, time here in Amherst, you know, I've, I've seen um, 
the ceremony where you uh, you welcome in new employees, um, either whether they're police or, or fire. And um, I was in a room and, and one day I just, it was just so stark to me that everyone who was, you know, hired, I mean, it just was a, a sea of white people. And um, that, that was pretty um, stark to me um, when, when I experienced that. And so I, I'll pause right there because I see Jennifer coming on and I don't know if there are other people waiting to um, speak. So I'll just, um, I've done my job of breaking the ice and I hope other people will say something. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Vera. You could continue. There are no hands raised. Um, I think that the CSWG is finding your input right now very helpful. And so if you have more to share, that would be great. If not, we can open up again to the floor and ask if others have something to share. Ms. Moisson, if, if no one, if there are no hands raised, I'd like to extend uh, Ms. Cage's time um, for at least a couple of more minutes if she has uh, some final comments to make so that um, mm -hmm. we can also give other people a chance to come in. But. Uh, sure. That's so actually my daughter, Monica Cage, wants to join. So I'll mute and. And Sean, do you see Monica, if you can um, bring her in? Yep. Share that right now. Hello. Can you all hear me? Okay. So my name is Monica Cage and I'm a senior at the high school. Um, and like you mentioned earlier, we are kind of in this bubble in Amherst, right? But I do have a large handful of, you know, my black male friends who are starting to drive and everything. And we have this one big group chat and it's like, whenever someone gets pulled over, they like, they let us know and they're so scared and it's it's overwhelming like I'll like I can't like put my phone down until I know that they're okay and whenever they have these interactions whether it be like for something really small they shouldn't have to have their like chest like like their heart beating through their chest like they shouldn't have to be so scared but that's just the reality I don't think that we can like find a solution to make that like go away because that's 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 it is what it is right but I think that if you know there is a connection that is built between police officers and these like black youth like it's not like if they if they just recognize an officer's face they can know that it's not the end of the world there, there there's a sense of comfort there's something I don't know because like that just happens so so frequently it's like once a week like I'm seeing one of my friends getting pulled over and they're just conveying how like stressed and how like scared they were so I just think that we should find a way to like build that bridge instead of having these kids who didn't do anything wrong think that their life is going to be over when in reality, like it, it may be something just smaller than that, but that's just what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for sharing. And so we can open back up to the community if anyone would like to share. And I'm gonna ask the community safety working group members if they have questions um, in, re in regards to anything that Ms. Monica or Ms. Vera shared or feel like they need some more information. Yes, Ms. Pat. Just expressing my own opinion, I'm not actually surprised that some resident will be hesitant to come out 
to speak publicly. So I knew this was coming. It wasn't a surprise. And that's why I was pushing for ambassador type of concept um, to get more resources to help us have people who are comfortable going into the you know, grassroots to get information from us. So I'm not surprised tonight, unfortunately. Yes. There is um, a, a lack of trust with authority for multiple reasons. And um, then it, when you gear it specifically to the police, that becomes a little bit more problematic. So um, other ways of, res of, of reaching out and connecting to the community would, are, are ways to do that. Um, so it, it's very hard to connect. Um, with individuals as a whole. And we have a few new individuals in the audience. Would anybody like to share any experiences that they've had? Or any experiences that they've witnessed? my yes Vera okay um let's see you know I I think that um I I just wanted to to, to speak to um the the police force and and or and how how police how some communities may view the police. Um, you know, something that may seem harmless um, can be experienced in, in w totally different ways. Um, and, you know, for, for example, um, I, 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 think, I think communities are, rightfully fearful of the police. Um, I think speaking to what happened at the Capitol, it, it confirms people's uh, sentiment that the police um, come down harsher on people, communities of color than they do when they're able to see themselves in the people that they're, you know, that that were riot, you know, trying to riot and 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 force themselves into the into the Capitol building. Um, it it just, you know, and 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 what for for Amaris, you know, um, there's a lot of work to be done, um, especially engaging, you know, with with young people. Um, I know there were a group of boys of color that were um, hanging out in town um, in front of the fire station. And, you know, and this also speaks to um, the lack of places for young people to congregate, you know, to, to be and, and to socialize. Um, and so, you know, they were getting food and they were outside waiting for other friends to come by and, you know, um, a police officer engaged with them and said, you know, they just got a call that there was shoplifting that took place at the CVS nearby. Um, subsequently told them that they had to, you know, go with the officer into the CVS and, you know, they, they felt that they had to, um, because there was a, the threat of um, arrest. Um, and so, you know, experiences like that, um, it, it just, you know, it's, it's pretty traumatic um, for young people. Um, and that in, in reading the police report, you know, the perspective of the police that they were um, somehow, they thought that they were perceived to have been friendly, um, that they weren't threatening, um, and that they weren't trying to instill fear in in these, you know, young people. Um, and and so, you know, I think that 
you're never going to hear, you know, these young people file a complaint with the Human Rights Commission or go to the police station, you know, and say that they have a grievance against how they were treated by an officer. Um, these young people know that they have to live in this community. Their parents have to live in this community. Um, and, and so they, they just you know, have to, to have to deal with that as part of their experience. Um, and, and I think it, it could be very triggering and traumatizing. Um, and I, I don't believe that there's enough um, available for, for young people to process this and to engage with each other um, and to really, you know, feel empowered in this community um, to have a voice and to, to, to change the course of their, you know, their experiences. Um, so that's, that's one example. And, and also, you know, you know, this, the experience of, of having the police come to your door, you know, to, to ask questions and all those, those things. I mean, those are, those are experiences that um, can be very troubling for, for people. Um, and so I think they're, when I hear that, you know, some of these police officers that we have, you know, that we're hiring and they're coming from predominantly white, all white communities, um, and they, they come here to, to Amherst, you know, um, we're a lot more diverse, you know, than, than, than other communities nearby, you know, that we're recruiting from. Um, and I, I think it, you know, the issue of, of, um, you know, we have educators on, on the on the working group, but the middle school has always been that I've heard, you know, really, you know, a hard time for for young people. And I part of it, I believe, is the fact that we have um, Amherst children and then now they're, you know, they're being in an environment with like people from Leverett or Shootsbury or Pelham where it isn't that diverse. Um, and so um, there's, you know, there may be misunderstandings, arguments, fights that happen in, in that setting. Um, and when um, you add in the, the school to prison pipeline and, and the, the dis disparate, you know, disciplinary actions that take place, um, you know, you're, even though, you know, I think the school district recently passed a resolution to not have um, school resource officers. Um, I find that, you know, we don't have to when, you know, school districts, school personnel can just call and, and they're right there. Um, and, and, there, and there's not enough, you know, I think crime happening in this community. So they'll show up, you know, to deal with, with young people. Um, and then we're not, thinking about other ways um, to support young people and their development, um, you know, as, as they go to school, as they're being socialized and all that, all that. So thank you. Thank you again, Vera. Thank you. Thank you. Could I, could I ask uh, Ms. Cage a quick question, a follow-up question? Ms. Hi, Vera. Hi. I wanted to ask, um, in terms of talking about, do um, you feel like uh, the Amherst Police Department that they have any outreach in, in our communities, in our BIPOC communities in Amherst? Do you see them, you know, do programs, activities with young people? You know, I, I've only heard, I mean, that's not something that I would necessarily want police officers to be doing, you know, um, they're armed, armed people that are supposed to be, you know, um, doing other things except, you know, so I, I, that's not, I don't think there's strength in, in, with respect to engaging with youth. Um, I'd rather see that happening elsewhere. But what I do hear in terms of interactions with young people, I mean, I, you know, I, um, you know, there was a story that was, there was an account that was told to me about how, um, you know, police officers are looking for young people um, if they are su suspecting them of, you know, smoking weed or selling drugs or, or something like that. So that, you know, they're, 
they're being engaged with them on the streets. And so these are young people that aren't with adults, you know, um, and the police officers are talking to them and wanting to find out stuff. Um, and so, so that's, those are accounts that I've, I've heard about. And then they're, they're being, you know, tracked or monitored in the schools. Um, and before you know it, you know, they're in the, involved in the in criminal justice system. Um, so, yeah, so, so that's, that's, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but, but, um, you know, these, you know, I don't, I don't want us to be focusing on supporting and, 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 and funding programming that will um, engage the police with, with young people um, with that respect. I, I think that, you know, people don't want to deal with the police. Um, they want to live their life. They want to have good experiences that doesn't involve the, the cops. Thank you, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And um, Vera, can I just follow up? So I know that there was a police officer who during his off duty time spent coaching uh, basketball and that created a great relationship with some of the youth. So how do you feel about that type of outreach? I mean, if those off, if that officer is spending time in this community and, you know, I think it's great, you know, I think that, um, it's, it's, you know, the more you, you empathize and, you know, with, with people and, and with communities, you know, that's, that should be part of the requirement and qualification. Mm -hmm. And so you're just saying not, don't show up to the events, perhaps full suited trying to hang out with the kids I mean I'm you know I I you know I, I'm not I think I think people experience you know differently you know um, even you, knowing that they're cops you know I think people's ex experiences are, are real um, and, and cops aren't you know they're they're trained to, to do violent things, you know, they're trained to, to, it, to be in situations where they can kill somebody, they can maim somebody, they can hurt somebody, they can, you know, it, it's, it's a power, you know, um, it's, it's a powerful position, it's a powerful job. Um, and so we don't know the types of experiences young people come up, you know, have, have lived. And um, for some people that might be a turnoff, you know, they might avoid being, putting themselves in that scenario or situation. Um, but, you know, for, for that cop who wants to engage with young people and, and they wanna put themselves in that situation and, and be that, that cop, then that, that's what, you know, that's, Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and I see that Donovan Robinson has his hand raised. Sean, could you let him in as a panelist, please? Yes. Welcome, Donovan. Do you have comments? Hi, everybody. How are you? Good to see some familiar faces. Can you hear me? I can't hear anyone. I don't yeah, know we can we hear don't. you. <laughs> we haven't said anything. How are you? <laughs> uh, good. Good to see you. Oh, uh, yeah. We're all my, muted. Oh, okay. that makes sense. Um, yeah, my you. So we're sharing. My mom told. I, I'm not. I wasn't really informed too much about this panel discussion. Um, but my mom just told me to um jump in and maybe it would be of use for me to share one of my situations um if if that is appropriate <laughs> for right now yes please do all right um so this is back 
uh, 2016, 2017. So I haven't really been in Amherst like all that much since then. I mean, I mean, I, I've been in and out, but I don't really, I'm not in Amherst that often, but my whole family's there and I visit as much as I can and all that. Um, but yeah, this situation happened on New Year's 16 to 17. Um, and yeah, I, I'll, I could, I literally have the, the written report that I wrote, but never handed in. <laughs> I just never handed it in. Cause I was like, it's, there's no point, you know, like back in 2016, 2017, I was like a lot more discouraged about the potential of me being heard in any facet in terms of police. And yeah, I've never really felt comfortable. I've had many situations throughout high school. Um, but yeah, this specific situation, I was leaving a New Year's party um, right before right before the clock struck 12. And I was trying to make it back to my girlfriend at the time's house. And I was walking on Southeast Street, walking down after I left this party. I don't know even where it was. Um, Eve, Evening Star Drive in South Amherst. And yeah, uh, I guess somebody had called the cops uh, to the party. And I was just literally wrong place, wrong time. Like, that's what happened. And... I was walking past Southeast campus and this is where it all happened at Southeast campus. Um, the police officer pulls his car in front of me, like as to, as if he was like turning into the Southeast campus to make a U-turn or something. And so I waited for him to go in front of me and then I walked around him and then he reversed into me, like as if he was going to hit me with his car. And so I, I, I stopped and he immediately like just jumped out of the car, told me, put my hands up, immediately handcuffed me, said he was detaining me. Um, it didn't give me any information. Uh, so let's see. <laughs> uh, yeah. So he, and he really ran, he ran towards me with his hand on his gun. And I, I said, I was like pretty, like I was, it was a, time in my life where I felt pretty kind of confident that I wasn't doing anything. And so I felt like maybe I, you know, I had a chance that it would be, he would just be like, Oh, sorry. I thought you were the, someone else, you know? And so, you know, he said, I said, may I ask why? Um, he said, if you cooperate, I'll tell you why. Um, he said, put your hands behind your back, cuff me up. And then kind of, started like harassing me like he was he was searching me but he was like where's your like kind of asking me these questions as if I was I was who he thought I was and I at this moment like I had no idea like I literally have no idea what's going on I'm just trying to get home for New Year's like I have no idea what's going on he's like where's your gun where's your gun like over and over and over and over and over again I'm like you're searching me sir like there's no gun I've never touched a gun <laughs> like you're, you're you see i'm here and he's eventually told me that they were looking for a black male in a red jacket and i was a black male and not quite a red jacket but some may consider it red it was maroon um and yeah he just you know kept asking me these questions over and over and over again that i continued to answer and while I'm cuffed, and now there's kind of a crowd starting to build of the party that had just broken up and all the people are coming out and they see what's going on. They see me in handcuffs and they're all kind of like sort of gathering. And so I start speaking. I'm like, everyone, like, I never did nothing in my life. Like, this is crazy. You're, you're witnessing, like, you're like, I don't know, you're witnessing racial profiling at its finest like i don't know if you ever seen it but this is what this is how it happens i was walking home like i'm just like giving everyone all the information that i have trying to get someone to like 
come closer to me to be like, yo, like, can, can we stop this? Um, and then there was one girl there who I remember from fifth grade. And so I like kind of, I isolated her out of everyone. I was like, you remember, like, she was a white girl, but I was like, you remember me, you know, I've never done anything like you, like go tell somebody what's going on right now. And so she did that. She told whoever needed to know, but they were like not having it. And they said, if I keep talking, they're going to arrest me for disorderly conduct. And so I, then, I, then I shut my mouth and then they kept asking me questions. And so I didn't answer any questions. And eventually they put me in the car and then I'm watching the clock go. Now it's 2017. Now it's 2017.01. And I'm just like, all right, like, are they going to bring me to the station? Are they not? And then eventually uh, my friend showed up and they all thought that I had left or been taken downtown, but I was still in the car. And so they were looking for one of my friends. Like, I, I guess I had said like, this friend knows I was in this place at this time. And so I was like, go find this person pretty much. Like I can call him if you want me to, but you can go find him too. And then he shows up right there and I'm like, that's him. That's him. And the cops like, that's not him. That's not him. I'm like, that's him. Like, that's him. I'm like yelling his name from the inside of the cop car. He can't hear me. And then finally the cop like rolls down the window to like double check. And I scream like Ethan. I'm like, Ethan. And then the cop is, and then Ethan comes over and the cops like searches Ethan. Ethan starts crying. And then eventually I got the white voucher and I was good to go. And so they didn't give me, you know, they took my picture. They said, you'll be hearing from me but I never heard from them. And so it was like, yeah, it was kind of like nothing happened, but it was like just at the, you know, it was like edging on a situation that could have gone very wrong. And I, I feel like if they had taken me in, it, it might've gotten worse. Um, but yeah, you know, they said, sorry for the inconvenience. And I went on with my new year, but yeah, that was that was my most recent story with Amherst police. And so I figured it'd be useful for y'all to hear that. I don't know. I There's probably more details that I'm forgetting. I don't feel like reading the whole thing. <laughs> but, yeah. That's okay, Donovan. We appreciate your share. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Yep. And um, Sean Amara, could you identify yourself, please? Hi, my name is Amara Donovan. Um, I have public comment as well. Yes. Um, I grew up in Amherst. Hi, Donovan. Uh, I grew up in Amherst with Donovan. Actually didn't know he was going to be on this call, but just wanted to affirm and acknowledge your story because it's not uh, a lone standing story. Um, I was going to comment about some of the experiences that I witnessed as a child and a college student in Amherst um, and also don't want to use that as a way to re-traumatize folks telling their stories. So um, instead, I'm going to comment a little bit about the systems that I've been seeing um, playing out in my upbringing and then what I've seen on this call as well. Um, and just for some context, I um, am a founder now of the Cambridge Families of Color Coalition in Cambridge um, and also work for a group called Canopy Equity Coaching, where we do racial equity training for corporations and education systems. Um, and so what I've been noticing is this queer um, connection that folks have been drawing between the school to prison pipeline um, and policing in Amherst. And that's something that I absolutely witnessed in my upbringing in Amherst in terms of tracking kids, um, kids of color, um, particularly receiving higher rates of IEPs and 504 plans and all of these things that we institutionally know. Um, and then seeing that also happening in the police system in Amherst and the way that we think about um, public safety. And so one of the things that um, I would encourage this group to, to look at and to press the city for is around data and in reporting. And some of the things that we see directly in the education system are being um, replicated in the policing system in Amherst in terms of some of the things that have been mentioned tonight that Donovan talked about in terms of reporting. Um, so for example, when a child is suspended or expelled, that's something that's tracked and reported. But when a child's sent to the office or asked to get picked early up early from school, that's something that's not. 
um, reported as a suspension or expulsion. So that's those are pieces of data that we are missing. Um, and it's the same thing that's happening in the policing, right? So Donovan's talking about being pulled over, being searched, um, folks of color in Amherst being um, stopped and searched and questioned and um, made to prove themselves. Um, and then an arrest not happening, um, happened to me multiple times driving with black friends and cars in Amherst and getting pulled over and that those data points not being collected by the town of Amherst. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of work to do in collecting data, especially in informal situations and things that may not be reported like an arrest. Um, and then aggregating, getting that data aggregated by race. Um, and so just drawing the connections between that education system and the policing system in Amherst. Um, and then the other question that I and my friends have had multiple times throughout our upbringings in Amherst is what is the reporting process, right? And who in the community is there to support a reporting process? Um, and also to give community members expertise and knowledge on how that reporting process works. Um, if somebody wanted to report an officer or an incident, um, what does that process look like moving forward and providing, I think, transparency and clarity um, throughout all of these processes are vitally important. Um, and also having a person, um, ideally a person of color, a person who comes from our community to steward that process and to support folks who wanted to um, to, to do any type of reporting to do that. Um, and so those are the, some of the things that I see missing and lacking from um, our public safety, um, especially for young folks of color. Um, and I understand that this working group in itself um, and the representation on the working group is fa a fantastic first step. And this is kind of an attempt at um, a needs assessment of our community. And I would just further encourage this group to um, do a needs assessment that really prioritizes folks at the margins within the community, knowing that when we build for the margins, we build for everybody all the way up. Um, so I would encourage this to be really a first step in the needs assessment of what our community is looking for. Um, I talk a lot about reimagining and dream destinations of what our town could look like and feel like for folks, specifically folks on the margins. Um, and then co-designing solutions with them. So I recognize that this is a first step and that we have a really long way to go um, and just want to affirm um, all that this group is doing and encourage some asset mapping and thinking about where the levers of power lie in our town um, and thinking about what those levers are for different people to really push the change that you all are fighting for. So thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, Amara, very much. And is there anyone else who would like to share? And do the community safety working group members have any questions for anyone who has spoken? I have a question. Yes. Um, I don't know if Donovan's still in, but um, the question I have um, that came to my mind from just hearing um, you speak is why didn't you report the situation? What stopped you? I, I don't see Donovan on here anymore. Or are you just saying that as a what stops them? Well, I think, I mean, I think it, like, I think it's important to have an understanding when we are able to hear a story from someone, what prevented them from reporting. Um, I did hear him say that he didn't think it mattered. And that worries me that because it reinforces bad behavior. So it's just something that I think that definitely needs to be looked at and addressed and maybe even considered as something we're looking for um, when someone does have a poor experience, um, maybe looking into reasons why they might not have reported. Um, so that's it. It is a great point and question.
Mr. Wiley. I think this points points out, you know, both, you know, the the opportunity for people to talk in addition disadvantage of not being able to interact more freely. And I and I understand the, the context of this, but that question that Ms. Bowen, is, I mean, uh, Ms. Walker is is asking, is one that that begs a conversation. And you know, I, to to what you you know you've done, you know, Ms. Moyes, and certainly you said, you know, you've asked us if we have any questions and things like that. And I think that if if I'm in the proper vein of of addressing this in in an appropriate way for this committee, uh, I I would like to think that maybe that's a question we explore in our general work uh, in keeping with, with our mission that, that maybe we can explore that question because I'm, sh I'm sure that there are others who have had similar kinds of experiences of not reporting for reasons that people know, but it would be important to get to the core of that. And I don't think this is the appropriate time to do it, but it's certainly something that the working group you know, would consider in its ongoing work as to how, you know, how to find out ways to explore and open up those avenues for um, understanding people's contexts in the time that they're, they're experiencing them. So I guess I don't want to go too further in that, but I, I just think that, you know, the fact that Ms. Walker is asking the question points to the fact that this working group that's information the working group needs to find out. And if we can maybe think about that going forward as a group, how do we begin to explore that in, in our data collection, in our hearing our narratives, et cetera. So I don't want to, I don't get too further into that, but I wanted to support Ms. Walker's uh, question in that way. And then just for clarification, that was Ms. Bowman. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize, Ms. Bowman. It's okay. But thank, but thank you for raising the question and I hope you heard my comment. Thanks. You're welcome. And, you know, I think that it raises a great point about the, about things that happen that aren't reported, right? And I also think that while we live in a city where we're not necessarily dealing with the police who are drawing guns there is a, a a power structure that is set up that affects our youth um you know they're the police so they're to some degree already intimidating right just off a of general principle never mind including the fact of the color of your skin miss pat so mine is not a question um but um for the last speaker, uh, Amara, um, the issue of special education and tracking of uh, students of color is something I'm very passionate about that I've been aware for more than 30 years in this community. So, you know, thank you for raising that. And I hope our community, our CSWG will dive into that more because we're talking about um, school to pipeline uh, system, that's, that's where it begins, putting so many, many of our kids into special education. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any more additional questions or any other speakers that would like to speak? Um, Mr. Wiley, I don't know if you want to try and open up to the broader community to hear comments. Yes, I, I would like to open this up to comment. I, I think we are we're fulfilling our role to, to listen very deeply and, in, um, and seriously about what people are saying. And I'm, let me just encourage people to take the opportunity to speak at this forum just to say simply that the, the more information we have, whether it's narrative, whether it's more uh, concrete data, whatever, whatever you're able to tell us through your experiences is gonna inform our work and help us make the kinds of uh, recommendations and give us guidance on our conversations going forward 
So I would, Ms. Moyston, like to open this up to the, to the public for a comment. And I would encourage us as a group to uh, kind of put ourselves on mute at this point and wait to see who comes forward. Yes, Mr. Garrick. Has a comment. Sean, can we move him over, please? Welcome, Mr. Garrick. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. I, um, you know, I really, uh, you were asking uh, for people to comment. I really uh, just wanted to say thank you and um, to say uh, uh, that I don't know how many people are, are, uh, are engaging in this right now, but uh, I wanted to let you know that I think I do represent people that are, are here to listen. We want to hear um, something that struck me uh, that Mr. Donovan said uh, is, um, you know, he kind of said um, nothing happened <laughs> and something happened. I mean, uh, I, I, I just feel very badly that he feel like, felt like he had to apologize um, for his experience as opposed to the other way around. Something happened. Um, he had a negative interaction. I want him to know that we, I heard it there. I know there are people here in my neighborhood that uh, are like me that are listening. Uh, and so thank you for letting us listen. That's all I really have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Garrick. Anyone else? anyone seen or witnessed or experienced? Ms. Moyston? Yes. You have a hand. Oh, Mr. Vernon Jones. Since we have time, I wonder if we could put up the questions again. And the, sure. You know, we have a question there about uh, how might we provide services in an alternative manner? And I wondered if everybody had a chance to see that question, whether there might be anyone who would be willing to, uh, to address that. Actually, the last two questions. I'm going to check in with Mr. Hannon. Oh, Mr. Wiley. I'd just like to, I want to thank Mr. Vernon Jones for asking it to come back up on the screen. And um, is there a way to keep that up there for a moment longer? We, because yes. 
Yeah, because we did have some people join later, I believe, than when the questions first came up. And perhaps this will be a, a will help prompt some thoughts from people. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, yes, yeah, certainly, Mr. Um, Mr. Okay, I'm being told at this moment, no, there are no hands raised. Oh, Darius, Mr. Cage, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, since there was like no conversation going, I just wanted to um, echo what was said before on how, um, Mr. Donovan, like he felt his experience wasn't great enough to share it and wasn't gonna, wasn't anything gonna happen. Um, I just like, as a, as a, the CWSG or C, uh, whatever, um, I just feel like that's a big part of our work and we should key in on not what the data is showing, but like what actually the people are going through and like the experiences that stop them from going and reporting it. Um, I just feel like that's very important in our work and how we can help the police and our communities connections and how we just see each other. Um, and I just feel like that's a big, part, a big part of our work that we have to accomplish. Absolutely. Any other comments or experiences to be shared? Damara. Hi, um, I can talk more about this. I'm very passionate about it and have a lot of experience. Um, I grew up in Amherst as a white presenting Latina with a lot of um, black and brown friends. And so when we're looking at the um, first question about have you experienced or been made aware of situations in which white people and BIPOC folks were treated differently by the Amherst Police Department? Um, yes, I think that's a, a given. Um, throughout my experience as a student at the high school, um, I would notice police watching my friends, following my friends around stores, um, especially when high school would let out and there's masses of kids moving down um, into the downtown area, there's a clear distinction between the way policing is done um, when groups of youth of color come together, for example, um, at the pizza place at the end of the high school, um, in the graveyard at the end of the high school, and how those kids are surveilled at higher rates than white kids, um, than white athletes, um, than white affluent and privileged kids. Um, and then as a college student at UMass, there were many, many, many situations um, involving drugs and alcohol in which um, black and brown folks were arrested, um, were given summons, were searched um, when myself and other white presenting folks were not. Um, uh, you especially saw this with families who had economic privilege as well um, in terms of who um, folks' parents were and how police treated those people um, versus kids of color. Um, I witnessed twice in my upbringing in Am Amherst physical violence from police against um, black and brown youth and young adults. Um, that was completely unwarranted. Um, and then I think as an, as an adult, I witnessed a lot of times um, racial profiling in cars and getting pulled over specifically when my black friends were driving versus when I was driving. Um, and then the ways in which interactions with police are, are handled in terms of the expectations um, 
around drugs and alcohol, around things like Donovan said, the assumption of black and brown folks having guns and weapons um, that are completely unfounded. So I never received any of those accusations growing up presenting as a white person, um, but the people that I was around did. And then the other piece that I will just bring up is as an adult, there have been multiple situations um, that I've been in with other friends who are parents um, in which police have threatened to call um, DCF on um, parents of color who will not allow police to come into their house without a warrant or who will, um, when police are questioning them and threatening them, will threaten to call DCF um, and have their kids removed. So that's another very huge problem in Amherst that um, when you talk to caregivers of color in Amherst um, is a common story. And I think that when we're talking more about why Donovan and others don't report. It's um, a little bit further than nothing will happen. It doesn't matter. But I think there's also a huge fear of retaliation, um, a fear of being followed by police when you do speak up, um, a fear of being put into categories with folks of color who are highly surveilled in Amherst. So I think um, it not only doesn't matter because nothing, there will be no response but it also might cause more harm to the individual who's reporting. So I think that that's a system that we really need to think about. Um, and then thinking about building trust and confidence, I think that there needs to be an acknowledgement of the harm that has been caused to folks of color in Amherst um, for generations, and that's where you start. And then it's really about um, listening, responding, and taking action and co-designing and building with the communities of people in Amherst who are most impacted. Um, and that's really where change starts. So some comments since no one else is talking, but I would definitely encourage more voice, especially voice of um, folks of color and different um, abilities are also involved in the conversation. Thank you so much, Amar. Does anyone else in the audience have comments? And Ms. Loper has her hand raised. Hi, how are you guys? Um, I was just, as a, I, my name is Erica and I work here in Amherst and have raised my son here in town and I've grown up here as well. And I would like you guys to think about um, adding the UMass Police Department into you guys' discussion about changing the police and doing some police reform because a lot of our youth have had issues on campus for just being on campus and walking around campus and um, just being a child of color or youth of color on UMass campus. I know my child has had a couple run-ins um, for like no reason. So if you guys could add that or include them in some way, I would be really thankful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Loper. Any other comments? Is there follow-up from any of the community safety working group members or? Mm -hmm. 
Ms. Pat has her hand up. Oh, she didn't use that. I, I can't see it. Okay, Ms. Pat. So what um, the Marat um, said about youth of color being downtown Amherst, um, just trying to hang out and have good time, like getting pizza. As a former business owner downtown, I experienced a lot behind my restaurant building where kids of color after school will come and I have my white business people, my neighbors call police on the youth for no reason. I've seen our MS police searching the youth for no reason. My, my reaction at the time was to go outside, um, bring the kids, the youth into my restaurant, take them downstairs, try to distract and redirect them. And I you know, ask them if they've done their homework, do they want something to, to drink? Just you know, trying to make them feel not, not feel too frustrated or scared and um, just little things to, to show them that um, they didn't do anything wrong and it's not okay for what, you know, they've just experienced. And I saw that many, many, many times just for hanging around. Even when they come in front of the building, they get police call on them. Whenever I see police officer in it's always they're coming to check if there is shoplifting or they just have a, a crowd of kids of color together. But if you were white kids, nothing happens. I don't see any white police officers. And I'm talking for more than 10 years when I ran the, the restaurant. So um, thank you for raising that, um, Damara. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Pat. I open back up the floor to uh, anyone in the audience or community safety working group members. Ms. Moiston, Mr. Wiley is raising his hand. Oh, I can't, so that you have to use the, I can't see because my screen is occupied. I'm so sorry, Mr. Wiley. I do wanna say one thing in general to um, all of us who are on this call. <clears throat> and this, this is gonna come kind of as a, hopefully a voice of encouragement and support at the same time to our community. We have very rare opportunities, especially at this time, to share our thoughts and concerns and ideas about what needs to happen to make uh, and support uh, change within our community. This is only one avenue, but I, I do wanna offer as a way of being supportive and encouraging to this community is to see how deeply we can think about this and uh, channel our comments in a way that are gonna inform the work of this community safety working group. I, I spoke to the charge earlier and it's very clear. One of our things is to examine all the data and information that we get. And we're getting some information from people here this evening, which are, I'm sure I'm speaking for the group, is being acknowledged and truly appreciated. And I think this, that what we've heard so far is going to be helpful to us doing our work. But I also um, feel that there are probably, and I'm gonna go on a limb here, there are probably some folks who are sitting and thinking and absorbing and not sharing. And I don't mean that to be critical in a sense, but this is an opportunity for us to hear 
a broad-based response from our community. We're gonna have another one on Saturday. And there've been some people who have spoken two or three times already. And there's an absence of a lot of other voices, I'm sure. I think we've, in terms of these questions, I think we've, you know, we've talked about number one in a lot of different ways. Uh, we've talked about number two in a lot of different ways. And, you know, there are some pieces, some parts of these questions that if we could incorporate it in our thoughts and experiences and offer them, it only bolsters our work, especially in terms of uh, more about the recommendations coming for our community on safety surface services, more about, uh, you know, more, you know, through non-threatening alternative public safety services, things like that. I think we're very adept and skilled at describing the problem. I think we, as a community, need to start digging a little deeper to start moving towards solutions and what it would take. And I think with people who have experiences across the board, across the continuum with the police, there's something to be offered here. And I would just encourage people to use this as a time to offer that. I, I think if we, we don't use these opportunities, then it's, again, only left to a few people to respond for the entirety of our community. And I would just encourage people, if you have something to say or something on your mind to please speak it, because I think it's an important piece to hear all the voices. I, I wouldn't judge how, you know, whether you think it's too small or too large an issue, but here's an opportunity. And I would hate for us to, you know, any of us to squander an opportunity to speak to our community about such an important topic. So that's what I want to say, and I, I hope it encourages folks who have been sitting and listening to maybe offer something to our group tonight. And, you know, that said, I do want to appreciate all the folks who were on this call and certainly the, the thoughtfulness of our community. So I'll stop there, but I wanted to just sort of try to put a little fire under our, our commentary to see if we can dig a little deeper. Thank you, Ms. Moisten. Thank you, Mr. Wiley. So again, we open the floor up to uh, comments from the audience. If you could please use your um, raise hand function. Ms. Moisten, if no one is uh, talking right now, I just wanted to kind of follow up from what uh, Mr. Wiley was saying. Uh, uh, for some of the speakers already talked about, which is, you know, kind of, and, and Amara said it very nicely, which was, can you hear me? I can hear you. You were starting to uh, yeah, break up a little bit. I could see the internet was uh, saying that. But like, how can we kind of co-design? No, we lost. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yep. Okay. Sorry. So just kind of like, how can we work together to kind of uh, co-design some of these solutions and get more input from our community? So I think it would be important for anyone else that um, is going to be speaking to all kind of uh, focus in on some of that. Uh, Amara had uh, talked about that very, um, you know, at length, and it's really important for us to, to, to work together um in terms of coming up with some of these solutions because you know one of the realities that we've heard and I'm, i want to thank everyone that has talked about it because i know it, it it takes a lot of courage and it's not easy to do that um especially when it comes to our young people and how some of the speakers have talked about them being tracked and monitored and feeling that kind of adversarial uh you know uh, uh, um, environment that comes from the police and you know 
how can we as a community, you know, work together to come up with a, other solutions. So if, if folks had um, other input, ways, things to share, it would be really helpful. Thank you. So I was just sent a comment from someone um, and they were saying that it would be nice if we compensated those who have gotten up here and were so brave and spoke of their experience. As we are all aware, compensation for the BIBOT community sharing their experiences and asking for, I don't want to say their work, but having them help work has been um, a big topic lately. And so I think that we should all consider that as well, whether it just be like a $5 gift card to Bueno or, or whatever. That's a great idea. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. And is there any other comments? Um, and we do have a few folks in the audience. And just to um, reiterate what Mr. Wiley has said is that uh, you too as well have either witnessed or seen or have questions or um, even suggestions on how we can build this trust. Um, so we do suggest or we do ask that you share those with us. Nothing is too small, too big. Remember, this is a safe place, so there's no judgment here. Ms. Moiston? Yes. I also want to go back to the top to say that we um, did say that we would certainly uh, encourage and allow uh, BIPOC people to speak first before we open up to the broader community with the intent of listening to everyone. And I'm not sure if um, we've fulfilled that goal based on I can't make any assumptions about how people identify, certainly, but I would like to make an appeal to um, uh, BIPOC folks who are on this call who have not spoken and wish to, to do so at this point. And at the same time, if you're not in that identifiable group, I would also encourage you to speak at this particular time as well. We have scheduled this meeting, this, this gathering for two hours, it's 7.05 now with 25 minutes left to go. And I don't want to have us come down to the wire and have to try to fit someone in. So there's plenty of time to do that. So if you are a BIPOC person who's on the call and haven't spoken yet, I would encourage you to do so if you feel so inclined. Otherwise, I would say if you are not, please, you, you have the same invitation please speak and, and try to help us gather as much information as possible. Thank you, Ms. Moiston. Thank you, Mr. Wiley. Yeah, so the floor is open to all. And if anyone has any comments, thoughts, or experiences to share, we would like to hear them.
I do ask those all those who are in attendance to please help spread the word for Saturday's forum as well. It will be from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. And the Zoom link can be found under news and announcements, as well as the calendar under Community Safety Working Group. Moist, and I also want to remind people that they can uh, fill out the questionnaire, right? It's, yes. it's on, the, on, a, on the website too. And that's yes. another way we're trying to get input. Yes. And um, Ms. Dorothy Pam, Counselor Dorothy Pam has her hand raised. Yes, Counselor Pam. Uh, I just wanna say that I think that the idea that you put forward of gift cards to people who speak and perhaps people who fill out questionnaires is a really good one. I know uh, as an academic, um, book publishers are always trying to get us to fill out responses to a book or a program or whatever, and they offer gift cards. So it's, it's something that's across the board. And I think it's, um, it's really a good thing to do. So um, I have found this evening's um, meeting very, very useful. And I really do want to applaud uh, the young man who came forward and told his story. And I think as we all know, something very big did happen. And maybe that's why he doesn't come back to Amherst that often. Um, it sounded very traumatic and very upsetting, and I guess we're all glad that he stayed there and didn't run because it turned out okay, but it really wasn't okay. So, thank you. Thank you, Counselor Pam. And so, as we are coming into the last half hour of our um, forum, I would like perhaps if people have ideas to share about community engagement and how to engage folks, that would be great to share with now as well. Or if we could brainstorm perhaps ways to engage our community particularly the BIPOC community. Ms. Moyston? Yes. In, in support of the, the um, invitation you're, you're putting forward too, I'd like to add to that uh, and support that in this way. I heard as we all did something very early on and it's a, it's it's an ongoing theme of fear about making public comments relative to these topics fear of reprisal fear of retaliation fear of being identified and being more closely surveilled i'm, I'm putting all these words together within uh, the bipoc bipoc community in particular so I don't know if anyone has thoughts about how we might bridge that in some way to get the experiences out there, uh, have us all hear what they are and not feel that we're going to be threatened. Um, more closely surveilled without fear, what would it take our, for our community to begin to sort of break that, that glass ceiling to get to the other side? Um, I'm gonna, you know, as, as an African-American man on this committee, I do understand, feel, and have experienced some of the same things that people have experienced here, without a doubt, throughout my adult life. But my question now is not about me, but how do we begin to break that cycle and get into a realm where we can have uh, people understand what's inhibiting the conversation and 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 the and the claims that we have before us, and how do we get how do we get beyond that to a point where we can feel like we can speak um, openly and also feel that we can get a response that's genuine 
and um, and purposeful and meaningful and whatever word you want to put on it that would help build the trust in this community. So I'm just supporting what you're saying, Ms. Moist, and I, I we we really have to think collectively, as someone said earlier, maybe that was Ms. Ms. Bowman or 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 someone about how do we do this? You know, and if you have ideas about how to break that cycle, then these are the kinds of things I think we'd like to hear as a community. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Moyer. Absolutely. And just to further that, I, you know, Ms. Pat had spoke about the ambassadors or Amherst leaders, because we already have an ambassador team It's for the COVID. And so we could name them something different, but the, the notion of having people who are already community leaders in their own central community area um, and compensating them for their work to reach out to folks who already feel comfortable because this is again about being comfortable and not being comfortable having these discussions. Um, and so sometimes it's just best to have someone who's already established within their community to do that um, as opposed to come up here. So it does take little baby steps to restore and there's the deepest, the, the wound is deep. So it's, 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 it's hard, right? So it's open and how do we get that wound to close? And that will take a lot of work, but I do agree with Ms. Pat. Um, I don't know if anybody in our audience or any of the community safety working group members have any other suggestions. I know as a community participation officer, I really pre-COVID tried to get out into the public um, and join things that are already going on. Um, that's a little hard to do now with COVID. So, our, you know, our job is even harder, right? Because we have more barriers than we had before. And does anybody from the group have any um, suggestions? So I've just received a comment for food, music, uh, dinner for people who attend meetings. People want to come to a space that feels good. So music and art. And I do agree that, you know, sometimes if you are from the marginalized community on the lower income side, that attending a meeting versus, you know, with a fee of babysitters or you know, you could have picked up another shift is hard or during dinner time. So to be able to provide dinner at meetings is is a good suggestion. Music is all, everybody always appreciates music. That is one of those things that can bring all groups of people together. Um, so those are, some, that's some valuable input there. I will say thank you anonymously to the person who sent me that. And does anybody else in the audience or any um, community safety working group members have any suggestions, further suggestions? And if it's all right, is it okay if I take the questions down? I'm having a hard time seeing everybody this way or do you still want them to stay up? I think you can take them down, Ms. Moist. And I, I think people have had a, a, a long opportunity to look at them and contemplate them. And I think in the spirit of this, we're, we're broadening our, you know, our requests for inform, information sharing. We, it's an open palette. And I think we're trying to get as much as we can at this point. So thank you for putting those up. Yes, excuse me. Did we lose Miss Pat? I see how I can raise my hand now. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> but we did lose Miss Pat, so. So we're, we're coming down to the last 10 minutes of our meeting tonight. And um, I didn't know if anyone else had any last minute input, thoughts, opinions about engaging with the community, 
about experiences that they've seen or been through. No, okay, so I just, I do wanna say thank you for those who did share and uh, those who gave suggestions. This is not easy, as we all know, which is part of, you know, the response of how many folks that have attended. I will um, now ask that, is it okay, are, are we, do you guys wanna continue on with the regular meeting as such, with the upcoming events or? I would suggest we do so. Um, I don't want to say that in advance of any comments, certainly from the working group about if there are any other closing comments on, on this particular um, community forum that they want to express before we go into upcoming events. So I don't want to preempt that. So I would just open it up to the other. I, I, I would consider going on to the next, next point, but I would defer to anyone who wants to have any um, comments going forward before we do that. Well, um, I just wanted to thank everyone again who uh, spoke and just how much courage it took for everyone to, to have spoken during this forum. And we learned a lot of um, you know information that we're gonna definitely take uh, with us as we continue to do this work, but also to remind folks to spread the word about Saturday, three to five, and also the questionnaire. And hopefully, as Ms. Moyston said, we can get some gift cards out there and get people really uh, pumped up to, to share some information. The only way we're gonna be able to do it is if we do it together. Agreed. Agreed. Others on the committee, on the group, working group? Thank you, Ms. Ferreira. So I um, just wanted to, to go back and have us all take a deep breath. And I just also want to make the comments of, you know, it, it would have been nice to have 50 people in here with all of their experiences, but I think that there was real value um, in the comments that we did hear from the group. So sometimes it's just not necessarily about the the number, but it's about the value that the, the people have to offer us. And I think that, you know, the gift card would be a great appreciation of, thank you. We value your input. We value what you have to say. It might also encourage others to join, right? As they know, you know, they can be compensated in some way for, and, and know that they're valued and that their input is valued. So I just, I also wanted to make that comment. I'm gonna, before we continue back to the regular community safety working group meeting, um, because what we have heard is deep and heavy, I do ask that we all go back to the singing bowl and uh, take another deep breath once we hear the, the bell. Just kind of clean your energy and clear so that we can move forward. Um, and, and be ready for Saturday. So I, I just wanna also say that Friday evening, we will be celebrating the legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And there will be, yes, as Ms. Ferreira said, a second community safety working group community forum from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. The uh, Zoom information is on our website. You may also complete the community safety working group online questionnaire found on the community safety working group webpage at CSWG at AmherstMA.gov. Um, as well as you may always feel free to email the community safety working group at CSWG at AmherstMA. Gov or email myself, Moiston J at AmherstMA.gov or contact me by phone, 413-259-3002. And now, Paul, I hand it over to you. Well done. Thank you to, um, uh, to Mr. Hannon, uh, certainly, and to, to you, Ms. Moiston, and for uh, Mr. Bockelman for supporting all the work coming up to, to our first um, community forum. I cannot echo strongly enough the a message Ms. Moyston sent forward about spreading the word about the Saturday forum. 
And I would also encourage you if you came to this one and didn't feel compelled to share anything or maybe needed some more time to think to uh, reappear on Saturday. Uh, perhaps there's some additional thinking, maybe you were informed by something was said here or encouraged to share your, your, um, your opinion. So certainly I, I would encourage you all to do that. Before going on to the, and, and I will we'll go to the rest of our meeting agenda, but I want to, uh, while I'm on the public forum here, to uh, let people know uh, more specifically that each one of us on this committee on this working group has been working tirelessly, not just at from meeting, you know, at each meeting, but uh, from Ms. Moisson uh, across the board, each one of us um, are filling our capacity to, to do research, to ask questions, to challenge each other with our thinking, to receive our information. And I am privileged to work with such a, a, a group of folks uh, knowing that they are holding your best interest at heart. So I just want to say that on their behalf, they're, they're, they're just a smart, intelligent, challenging group. You couldn't, you couldn't do better. And so I want to thank them all publicly and, and encourage you to support them as well by connecting to the website and giving us feedback that Ms. Moiston uh, spoke about. So, uh, that said, uh, Ms. Morrison, I'd like to just go on with the agenda. Sure, yes. Certainly, and uh, um, the obvious upcoming event is our next forum on Saturday. Are there any upcoming events either related to this work or in our Amherst community that anyone R&R &R, um, working group would like to talk about or present to folks who are in attendance right now? I, I will just say that the Human Rights Commission is celebrating the legacy of Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on Friday from 5.30 to 6.30. Um, the Zoom information is on the website under news and announcements and on the calendar as well. You know, I waited for you to say that. <laughs> that was again, my plug. <laughs> again, your plug, yeah. And thank you for promoting that for our community. This is an annual event in our community that has um, great meaning for all of us in our community. So thank you, Ms. Moisten, for promoting that. And thank you for the people who are promoting and 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 organizing uh, that, that activity. Um, if there are no other comments, I'd like to just let people know that our next meeting is actually the community forum on Saturday from 3 to 5 p.m. We look forward to you being there. There's information on our website about that. We certainly have flyers out that were uh, th those flyers were created and, and certainly advanced by uh, Ms. Owen, who uh, is the vice chair of this committee. I want to thank her for her work on that. And uh, all of us support this effort. So the more you can do for us, the more we can do for you. So uh, hopefully we'll we'll get to that point. Are there any other um, topics uh, that I? did not receive in a reasonable amount of time in anticipation of this meeting that anyone would like to mention on the working group at this point, Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, I like this idea of providing $5 gift cards to anyone who spoke uh, at the forums. Uh, and we don't I think we don't actually have our own budget, but the town manager has indicated that we might be able to access the racial equity money uh, that's available in the town. Um, I, do we, is it appropriate to make a motion that we recommend such cards to the town manager that such cards be provided? So moved. Second. Any discussion of that motion? I just, um, I actually have something to say about that. <clears throat> I think, excuse me, I think we should, um, I think it should be $10 because I think about like, if we were giving them a gift certificate to Bueno for them to get a burrito and a drink, it's gonna be about $10. So I think that 
Yeah, like they could only, yeah, they could they could get a slice of, with $5, they could get a slice of pizza, but they couldn't even get a drink to go with it. So I think we should think about like, depending on how we're doing the gift certificates or if we're just giving them like money in hand or what, however we're doing it, I think we should just make sure we take that into consideration. Are there any other comments to the, the, the motion forwarded by uh, Mr. Vernon Jones before I come back to him? Uh, Ms. Sinoni Baku? You're muted. Pat. We can't hear you. Uh, okay. Mr. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So before the motion, I do want to, I do have a comment um, from business perspective. You know, how do we uh, value uh, somebody's time? Um, while I appreciate the suggestion for five or ten dollars, I'm not comfortable with that amount. I would like to suggest it would include <clears throat> a $25 gift card uh, for people who are uh, brave to come out and testify because it's, it's not an easy thing for people to do. Thank you, Ms. Matt. Are, are there uh, comments from, from the working group? I just want to add that Councillor uh, Pam has her hand raised as well. Oh, I'm sorry, I did we? Ooh, I lost some of that visual there. Go ahead. I don't know. Oh, there she is, yep. Oh, I see her now, yeah. I, I didn't realize I'd raised my hand, but I, I agree with the $25. Uh, it's It's gotta be worth something. And it's quite possibly possible that some of the local merchants could you know, be involved in this to reduce the cost of the committee um, because it is something that is very important to the whole town. It is, and it'll bring, bring business into their business. So yeah. it's worth the investment. Yeah. Thank you. I like the idea of involving businesses. So this is, this is the discussion that is in response to uh, Mr. Vernon Jones's motion and well, if my second, I mean, we're having a discussion about this. Uh, we're gonna come back, Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, Paul, you actually made the motion. Yeah, I did actually. Uh, <laughs> yes. so I think it, it goes to you as the mover. Uh, I, I, I I, I asked for certainly and and we heard from our our working group plus one of our community members and um, if if we are now at a point where at you know twenty five dollars for those who spoke um, at this particular um, event, I also want to ask if this is going to be something that we're going to be offering at the next community forum also in other community forums going forward. Yes. I, I think it sets the bar. So right. anybody who we, yes. Yes. who gives us their input, whether it be through email or through um, the survey or a forum would need to be compensated at that same amount because you can't change that amount. I just want to be clear with, with folks about that particular standard being set going forward, no no objection to it certainly, but to understand that, um, you know what we're setting as the standard. Other comments, Mr. S Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, I'm I'm very comfortable with the twenty five dollars for anyone who comes forward and speaks at a forum. Uh, I I don't support that much for uh, people who fill out the survey, and we we may have. We could have several hundred people fill out the survey, and I don't think that's how we want to spend our, our racial equity money because we're they won't all be they won't all be BIPOC uh, filling out the forms and all. Uh, but I'm very comfortable with doing it for people who come forward to speak at the at the forum. What about ten dollars for or five dollars for people who fill out the um, the uh, questions? The other thing is often um, I've looked at the survey or the questionnaire and there's quite a few that are anonymous. So there is no way to, to loop that back to them. So. 
Ms. Pat. I mean, uh, the project we're doing is very important. If it's important to the town of Amherst, I don't think um, $25, whoever respond is too much. I mean, we pay high taxes in this town. We are very, uh, 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 town of Amherst is well yeah. resourced. So I am okay, you know, to propose $25, whether you, uh, whether people want to testify publicly or through online or whatever. Our goal is to get as much input as we can. And I think we need resources to get this work done. That's where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and I think we just have to have the, the limitation on it that it's Amherst residents. Exactly. I like that. Yep. In, a, in addition to that, Ms. Moyson, I, I, you know, clearly an anonymous comment, you know, cannot be responded to, but, uh, and, and in terms of the, the, the money part of it doesn't concern me to the integrity of the process. I wanna be sure that if people are spending their time, we had, I, don't, I can't remember how many people on this, this call tonight who spent their time here, uh, their, their two hours with us to listen and participate. And uh, in particular, there were a number of BIPOC people who spoke. And the issue about um, offering people an honorarium, if you will, for participating was, was, I think, generated from the fact that it's difficult for people, especially BIPOC folks in many cases, right. to participate in these kinds of events. So how can we make it more, more welcoming? How can we make it more supportive? How can we do that? So I, I wanna just raise a question to, to um, folks too. I don't wanna encourage a process that just says, if you respond sort of kind of willy nilly <laughs> to this thing, you're gonna get $25. And I hate to say it that way, but I, I'm, I'm a little skeptical about that in some respects. However, if there are people like the folks tonight who were spending time speaking very ver fervently about things and, and very deeply about things and who made a sacrifice to be here, they're the ones that need the $25. Yep. So I don't know how we can figure out a way to, I, and I don't want to parse this out in, in such a discreet way, but I want to be, I don't want to be haphazard with it. I want it to have meaning for people and have you know, have it have a benefit to people who are making the sacrifice to be here. Yep. And I just, I think that the value that the BIPOC community has when they come to speak um, would be worth that $25, if not more in theory, right? But so perhaps for people who complete the survey, if they leave contact information, we can put them in a raffle for a $50 gift card, or we can find some other solution mm -hmm. to, sure. to find a way for that, right? Because you, you have to kind of somehow balance it to some degree, so. I agree, and, and I think the bottom line, excuse me, uh, Mr. Vernon Jones, I, I, and I think the bottom line is to encourage participation. Let me just say that and just stop. <laughs> Mr. Vernon Jones? I just wanted to say I like Jennifer's suggestion. I, that works for me. Other comments, uh, Ms. Pat? So actually, um, maybe some people may not want to accept the gift card. And um, I'm almost feeling that this discussion is going, you know, when it comes to BIPOC community, we start nickel and diamond stuff. So if anyone that responds, regardless how, they should be compensated. And not try to say if you do questionnaire, you get $5 gift card. If you testify publicly, you get $25. i am not comfortable with that. I'm not. Other comments? I'd like to bring this to a, a motion soon uh, in some fashion. Other comments from uh, members of the... Um... I think that we might need a little more time to follow up when we have just our next regular meeting, not through the yeah. forum. Um, so I think everybody's in to some degrees in pretty much agreement that the yeah. 
people who speak will receive. I think it's how we handle um, other folks and we should all kind of have our, uh, we should all be brainstorming about a way to find some compensation. But, you know, it could, you could equal them out or you, you could do a raffle or we just, you know, I don't want us, to, it's, you know, now 738 and I also, um, I don't want us to make a decision now so quickly. I agree. I certainly don't. I, 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 I certainly don't yeah. either. I certainly don't either. And I want to support what um, Baku um, stated. We, we don't want to nickel and dime this to death. I mean, it could become an, an extra activity. So, you know, Ms. Moyston, would it be appropriate for us to, um, as, as a group, to send these thoughts to you? Yes. Uh, our thoughts and suggestions, I would say, are, our, 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 I would, I put it in this way. Uh, your, your rationale for suggesting what you're saying, what you're, what you're recommending, and a suggestion on how to do it. To, to Miss Moyston, um, in advance of our, what will be whatever next meeting will do our business. It will certainly not be on Saturday. But in the meantime, we could do that if that's acceptable to the group. I want to hear everyone's voices on this. Are we all good? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yes. We can talk can about I, this, Mike. Yeah, I want that I, tomorrow morning at 8.30. <laughs> I will just, keep track of everyone who's speaking. Just kidding. In the just kidding. Do the best you can. We got a busy week ahead of us. This is a three meeting week for us in our community. So. I appreciate all the work we've done. So again, our next meeting, uh, are we all good with this particular point? Yes. Okay, our our next meeting is uh, certainly our, our community forum. Uh, on Saturday from three to five, we hope uh, people will certainly attend. And uh, there's, I think the next, the topic that the next, <laughs> The topic we talked about was actually the, the, the whole idea of the gift certificate, but um, uh, I think we can move on if we're, if we're all, as I say, the hearts and minds are, are settled and good at this point to adjournment. I move. Ms. Pat, you moved. Yes. Seconded. Seconded by Ms. Ferreira. If you if you all would just raise your hand so I can see you and we can record that. Mr. Vernon Jones, Ms. Owen, can't see some of you, but uh, Alicia Darius or Miss Walker, go. Mr. Darius, and Tashina all have their hands raised. We good. I just wanted to see people anyway. I didn't have to do that, but um, <laughs> anyway, thank you all for your work and. Um, uh, we will be in session again on Saturday at three from three to five. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moyston. Thank you, Sean. Jennifer, thank, thank you for Jennifer, facilitating you. so beautifully. Oh, and thank you. Was, You're welcome. Really yeah, I'm honored. Thank you. Good, yes. good job. Good Thanks. job. And Mr. Thanks. Hannon as well. Thank you. Anytime. And Ms. Sean. Thank you. Have a good you. night. Anytime. Good night. Have a good night.